This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror series. You're listening to the 80 Slasher Librarian's audiobook presentation of Twice Burned. Keep it scary out there. Hey, Slashaholics, this is the 80 Slasher Librarian. Be sure to check out and join the Facebook group page, follow the channel on Twitter and Instagram, and also check out the merch store and the Patreon page. Uh, the links to all of these are in the description below. Uh, just let you know, I depend on horror fans like you to keep this channel going and growing for years to come. Cannot monetize the channel due to the content and the copyrights surrounding it. So the Patreon is what keeps the channel funded. You can sign up and support the channel for as low as $2 per month. You get some great rewards depending on the tier you select. You get early access to certain content. A weekly exclusive podcast only on Patreon. You can also voice characters and audiobook narrations. You can get free merch, free ebooks, and so much more. Check out the Patreon page and sign up today for as low as two bucks. Really use your support, and you'll be helping this channel keep going and growing for a long time to come. Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror Twice Burned by David Bergantino Prologue Welcome back, beautiful dreamer! Just doing some reading by Furnace Firelight, a biography of the Marquis de Sade. Remedial reading, of course, so I don't mind if you interrupt. There's nothing like a good book for passing time between murderous rampages. Don't you agree? My children, my prey, are like books. I add a few twists and turns to sad storybook lies before bringing them to their unexpected endings. I am a great writer. <laughs> and prolific, too. Why, the boiler room is rather like a library of lost souls. While you're here, I have a real page-turner for you. Hold this book in your hands. Notice the quality of the leather cover? Human skin, specially tanned. And each dark brown letter is printed with the blood of victims from this very tale of terror. Novel concept, don't you think? But make sure you return this book before its due date. At this library, the fine for an overdue book is a killer! Chapter 1 Burn the witch! Burn her! Hands tore at her clothes, at her hair. She was dragged forward by the angry crowd, flung to the ground, kicked, then violently wrenched to her feet so the process could begin again. The hate in their eyes blinded them to the fact that she was not even struggling. She knew her fate and accepted it. A glob of wetness landed in her face. Wiping it away, she looked into the eyes of a boy who couldn't have been more than six years old. Witch! He screamed shrilly and spat at her again. She smiled at him. He's only a child, she thought. He doesn't know what he's doing. I forgive him. My baby! A bedraggled middle-aged woman saw the witch's smile and pulled the boy to her. She desperately hugged the child to her chest. The witch has cast a spell on my baby! With that, the woman dragged the child into the roiling crowd and was gone. 
she felt for the woman, and worse, for the child, who would grow up learning his parents' unwarranted hate and fear. Then the thought was abruptly broken as she was yanked to her feet. Strong arms grabbed her, as if she had the power to escape, as if she wanted to escape. Before she could get her bearing, she was lifted, spun around, and slammed up against a rough wooden stake. Her arms were pulled behind her, and bound tightly by the wrists. A heavy rope was wound around her body, binding her even more securely to the post. Then, as she muttered prayers of forgiveness for her misguided murderers, she noticed the instability of the surface on which she stood. If not for the ropes, she would surely fall. She looked down, past the screaming, hateful faces, past her feet. Books. She stood atop a mound of ancient books. The musty smell of yellowing paper and leather rose above the stench of hysteria. The scent would have calmed her had she needed calming, but she understood. The adults didn't understand what they were doing any more than the boy did, but she knew they were fulfilling a destiny assigned by a much greater power. She had seen and recognized this destiny long ago in the many visions bestowed upon her. Again, she smiled tenderly at the crazed mob that meant to kill her. Many screamed and turned away, afraid of bewitchment. An approaching torchbearer became so frightened that he dropped the torch in the crowd, nearly setting fire to the long skirt of a nearby woman. Blindfold the witch, someone screamed. Silent she may be, but curses us with her eyes. With that, a sweat-soaked piece of cloth was drawn tightly over her eyes and secured by a knot behind the post. But even with the blindfold, she could see the scene quite clearly. She was being granted her final vision, her own death. A voice shouted from the crowd, She is powerless! Now burn the witch! Burn her! The crowd joined in, chanting, Burn the witch! Burn the witch! A new torchbearer moved forward. He was bald, his face scarred and deformed. He leered with evil delight as he held the torch up for all the crowd to see. The crowd responded by chanting faster and louder. Then turning from the mob, the hideous man threw the torch at the pile of books. With a whoosh, the volumes burst into flame. Half the mob began to cheer as the other half continued their chant in a feverish pitch. Burn the witch! Burn the witch! Burn the witch! Heat rose from beneath her. A thick, choking smoke billowed up from the burning books, and for the first time she felt doubt, and with it, fear. What if she was wrong? What if this was not her destiny? The tattered remains of her dress caught fire, and searing heat began to consume her legs. She struggled against her bonds, but clearly she would be dead long before the rope would burn through. She ceased struggling and accepted her fate. From her impossible vantage point, she saw the crowd stoking the fire with more books, the deformed ringleader urging them on. The chanting subsided then, and was replaced by a watchful silence. No doubt they expected more struggling, or some final terrible curse. But she struggled no more, and never cursed them, not even as the heat and smoke began to overwhelm her. She would not curse them, she would simply die. The torchbearer stood there, his arms crossed, waiting. Wow, weirdo Rama! exclaimed the pudgy, bespectacled boy sitting next to her in history class. It was toward the end of the period, and the students were allowed to converse as the teacher reviewed their report proposals. Good thing you woke up before you died. If you had died, you wouldn't have woken up. Don't say that, Colleen Martini smacked Kirk's hands. He had been drumming on her desktop for the last ten minutes. Kirk leaned back in his chair, a snide grin on his face. That should teach you to watch what you read before bed. What do you expect when you fall asleep in the middle of Joan of Arc's life story? He rocked in his chair. Do what I do. Read comic books before you go to sleep. Then, if you dream, you're a superhero or something. That's the way to go. 
Unable to contain his excess energy any longer, he began to drum his hands on his thighs. Kirk Newman had been Colleen's buddy since homeroom in seventh grade, and she couldn't remember a time when he hadn't been nervous and fidgety. Today, he seemed more agitated than usual. She suspected he was preparing to launch into one of his periodic declarations of love for her. He claimed to have a permanent crush on her, and every six months or so would ask her to be his girlfriend. Colleen hated when he got that way. Close as she felt to Kirk, he wasn't her type, dating-wise. And after each time she gently rejected him, their relationship would become uncomfortable for a while until he got over it. The time was ripe for him to fall in love with her again, especially now that she had begun to date Kirk's cousin, Lance Matthews. It wasn't right for Kirk to feel as competitive as he did with his cousin. After all, Lance was a freshman in college. She and Kirk were still sophomores at Springwood High School. Colleen didn't want to talk about her dream anymore, nor did she want Kirk to make a scene that would embarrass them both. So she quickly changed the subject by asking the topic of his report. Each student had one week to write a paper on the historical figure of his or her choice. "'Who do you think I chose?' Kirk asked, leaning against the back of his chair with one arm. He looked off into the distance. He raised one eyebrow and narrowed his eyelids in a dreamy expression. Running his fingers slowly through his greased back hair, he took a long, slow drag from an invisible cigarette. This he tossed away with a practiced but still somewhat fumbling flick. For the big finish, he favored her with a smoldering stare that, set in his homely, doughy face, only served to make her laugh. Let me guess, she said between snickers. Barney the Purple Dinosaur? Kirk snapped out of his character instantly, trying to feign hurt, but his own smile kept him from pulling it off. No, the man, the legend, James Dean. Colleen shook her head, laughing as Kirk repeated his pantomime. He had been obsessed with James Dean for a long time. His bedroom walls were lined with posters, and his video collection contained every movie starring, about, or containing any sort of reference to the pop icon. The whole mystique, the fast cars and faster girls image, entranced Kirk. Unfortunately, the image fit him about as well as a neon blue suit would fit a funeral. Colleen had seen Rebel Without a Cause and East of Eden, at Kirk's insistence. It had been instantly clear to her that her friend did not resemble James Dean in the slightest. Elvis in his Vegas years, maybe, but James Dean, never. Suddenly, Colleen realized he was staring at her. At first, she thought he was still impersonating James Dean, but then she realized that the passion burning in her friend's eyes was his own. The time had come. He was going to ask her out. Colleen felt her face growing hot. There was an awkward silence between them. Somehow, the entire classroom became utterly quiet. Kirk appeared ready to say something, and Colleen was certain now that the whole class would hear. He took a deep breath. So did Colleen. Kirk snapped his mouth shut as Colleen let out all the air in her lungs in a long sigh. The history class, which had not truly been totally silent, burst into a low roar as students got up from their desks chattering away as they began to file out the door. Remember, called out Mr. Klusky, the history teacher, these papers are due next Friday. That's a week from today for the chronologically impaired among you. And some of you will be chosen to deliver the reports orally to the class the following week, so be prepared. Many students groaned in displeasure at this unexpected added announcement. Kirk stood quickly. The look of passion disappeared from his face. I'll, I'll, I'll see you later at the library, he said brightly to Colleen. Then, with a wink, he darted out the door. Colleen rose slowly as he left. Saved by the bell, she muttered quietly to herself. She finished stuffing her books into her bag, slung it over her shoulder, and headed out of the classroom. Wrapped in her own thoughts, Colleen didn't notice the figure that fell into step directly behind her. She did feel a little tickle on the back of her neck, just above the collar of her blouse. Reaching back, she touched the spot lightly, never breaking her stride. Seconds later, something sharp bit her on the neck. Colleen screamed.
Chapter 2 Colleen screamed again. Instinctively, her hands flew to her neck, and her fingers closed around something hard and smooth. As she tried to pull it off her skin, it was roughly yanked from her hands. She shrieked once more, then turned quickly at the sound of laughter behind her. "'Oh, you are Colleeny Weenie for sure,' taunted a coarse female voice. The voice belonged to Vicki Stratton, who was flanked, as she almost always was, by Tish Hughes and Melina Carlton. Almost in unison, Tish and Melina repeated, "'For sure!' Then they giggled like schoolchildren, watching a boa constrictor swallowing a rat. Colleen gulped and absently rubbed her sore neck. Without turning around, she was aware that many students were staring at her because she had screamed. A few of them knew that a tense scene was likely to follow. Considered a bad egg by all of the school's faculty and most of the students, Vicki Stratton was a rotten baker's dozen as far as Colleen was concerned. She certainly looked the part with her pointed black boots and black jeans so tight it looked as if Vicky had painted them on and stuck a brass button in her navel. Vicky's short auburn hair was swept back, revealing tiny ears that had nevertheless been pierced about five times each. Tish and Melina were cheap imitations of Vicky, each of them a bad girl in training. At the moment, the baddest of the girls, Vicky, held a plastic novelty shark on a stick. Manipulating the little ring at the end of the wooden dowel on which the shark head was mounted, she brandished it at Colleen. Each time Vicky pulled on the ring, plastic jaws ridged and teeth snapped inches from Colleen's face. Oh, look! Vicky squealed, bringing a hand up to her cheek in melodramatic surprise. I gave Colleeny Weenie a hickey. What will her big college boyfriend say to that, I wonder? Leave me alone, Vicky. Colleen knew she sounded whiny, but couldn't help it. Vicky lowered the shark on a stick and walked right up to Colleen. What are you going to do about it if I don't, huh? Their faces were inches apart. Colleen quickly shrank away from Vicky's glowering eyes. You know, we're reading a book in English class about you and your boyfriend. It's called Of Mice and Men. <laughs> a harsh laugh escaped her. Melina and Tish tittered in the background. Colleen just wanted to die. Then a voice spoke up. I wasn't aware you could read, Miss Stratton, judging from your grades in my class. Colleen looked up to see Mr. Klusky, standing in the door room of the classroom. Vicky's only response to him was a sneer. Now leave Miss Martini alone and get to class. I'll catch you later, Colleeny Weeny. Vicky winked and snapped the shark jaws in Colleen's face twice. Then she spun around abruptly and walked off, Melina and Tish following close behind. Mr. Klusky and silently thanked him for his intervention. He smiled at her sympathetically while shaking his head. If you'd like to talk, Colleen, my next period is free. No, thank you, Colleen replied, feeling her face flush with embarrassment. I have a class, but thank you. We wouldn't take the whole time, and I could write you a note. If you like, we could go down to the principal's office. Colleen began to back away, stammering. No, no, it, it's okay, Mr. Klusky. We don't have a problem, really. We're just two different people who rub each other the wrong way. I guess... I mean, I appreciate your concern and all, but I can take it, really. Like you said before, I'd better get to class. Colleen turned away, mostly to escape Mr. Klutsky's pitying gaze. Just as she did, the bell beginning the next class period rang. I'd better write you that note, at least, Mr. Klutsky called after her. Barely turning back, she called back, I'll be okay. Then she turned the corner. When she arrived at her math class minutes later, the look on the teacher's face made it clear she had heard about Colleen's confrontation with Vicky. Slipping silently into her chair, Colleen mouthed the word sorry. The teacher nodded slightly and resumed class. Nobody really understood exactly how sorry Colleen did feel. It seemed as if Vicky was at the top of the school's food chain and she was at the bottom. C'est la vie. Such is life. Though actually to Colleen it was more like C'est la guerre. Such is war. Because that's how life sometimes felt.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been the prologue, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Twice Burned by David Bergantino. This is the second book out of three that we're doing here, uh, that we're starting here in October, back to back to back. We knocked out Virtual Terror, we're doing Twice Burned, and uh, there's another one after this one. Uh, we'll get into that later. But for now, let's talk about Twice Burned, uh, what we got so far. Uh, first off, Really enjoyed the, the quick little prologue with Freddy. Uh, funny story to anybody who's uh, been with this channel for a while. Uh, before I ever read a Freddy... Because I, I didn't know about these books back in the 90s when they came out. Uh, I mean, I, I think I might have seen them at a book fair, but I never read them. And when I started this channel, I came up with this thing. It's like uh, the late fees at the 80s Slasher Library are a killer. And uh, the funny thing is, when I ended up being told that I should narrate these books, and I ordered these books, I was flipping through them, and I got to this one, and I saw that prologue where David Bergantino had uh, Freddie saying, you know, at my library, the books, the late fees, are a killer. And I was like, hey, great minds think alike. That's fucking, that's awesome. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, it's pretty cool, David. I think I've told you that story uh, before. Uh, one of the podcasts, uh, the one we did for uh, Deadly Disguise, maybe, or New Nightmare. Um, but yeah, I, I swear to God, I did not get that from your book. Uh, I was saying that before I ever uh, saw that in your book. Uh, but yeah, cool. I, I like that. It, it sounds better coming from Freddy, for sure. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed the dream at the beginning, uh, where Colleen, our new uh, protagonist, is uh, telling her friend Kirk about this uh, dream she had about being a witch and getting burned. At least that's how I took it, because he's talking about the dream after she, after that's over. I gotta say, I really felt like that was Freddy, obviously. Uh, it's probably obvious. In her dream, it was Freddy, you know, with the torch lighting her and everything. And her standing on the books was kind of, you know, kind of creepy, just sitting there trying to hold her footing while she's tied against this post. And just imagine standing on a bunch of books, and uh, they're going to go up fast, especially old books. So yeah, very creepy nightmare, her being burned. I'm hoping there's more to this dream. Um, I think I heard from somewhere that uh, there is, that this uh, comes this theme pops back up in the book. I mean, the book is called Twice Burned. Uh, so yeah, I'm really, this is, this is a book that really I was most intrigued about out of the set. So I'm excited to be on this one. Um, you know, out of all the, out of the four... Uh, that David wrote, and out of the entire six sets, uh, two of them were written by a guy named Bruce Richards, uh, this book was the most intriguing to me, and I was looking forward to reading it. Uh, so far, the cast of characters, we don't know a whole lot about them, but uh, I'm enjoying them. Uh, Colleen sound, seems like a really cool protagonist. I think we all knew somebody like Kirk in high school. I might have been channeling someone I knew like that uh, with the voice I gave him. Um... And, of course, you know, the uh, bad girl who has two friends, you know, two toadies that follow her around. We all knew people like that. So, I'm curious to see where this goes, and I hope that those two toadies and that bad girl, if they do bite the dust, uh, they get to do it together in a similar fashion. Uh, you know, so the toadies can go out like their uh, hero bad girl does or something. I don't know. Uh, I, it's too early to say a whole lot. Uh, too early to even be guessing uh, on who a killer might be in this book, unless it might be Kirk, because he's jealous, or that teacher, Mr. Klusky. He was nice, but he did seem kind of suspicious. So, David, uh, if I had to pick right now, gun to my head, I would say Mr. Klusky. But there's just not enough information uh, for me to do that yet. Uh, this is kind of a short upload. I wanted to get the book started tonight. Uh, one of our patrons is going to voice a character in this book. They're going to voice Lance. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be fun. And, uh, yeah, so, all we know so far is that Colleen is a pretty cool student. She's got a, kind of a nerdy friend, you know, with a big heart in Kirk, although he doesn't know how to take no for an answer, apparently. Uh, we got a teacher that's pretty defensive of some of his students, which is a little sus to me. Um, and, uh, yeah, we got the bad girl and her friends. I guess we'll be, we'll be meeting Lance, her boyfriend, the college guy, in the next upload. And uh, I'll have more to say then. But yeah, so far I'm enjoying the book. I like the characters. And I'm curious to see where it goes after that witch, uh, the, you know, her burning at the stake as a witch. And uh, I'm guessing that was Freddy, that, you know, the bald, deformed man that was, you know, lighting the, the pyre that she was tied to. Uh, we'll see if I'm right. 
when I'm back very soon with more of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, twice burned by David Bergantino. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. Get your books back in time to my library, too, because just like Freddy's library, the late fees here are also a killer. And uh, pleasant dreams! I'll see you next time.